Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kielseth, and to be more specific, that is filmmaker Alex Cox and myself, film curator Pablo Kielseth. Alex will join us by phone from his home in Oregon while I sneak away from my office to call him from one of the projection booths used by the International Film Series, which has been screening foreign and independent movies at CU Boulder since 1941. We will keep our chats to about 20 minutes as we discuss whatever movie-related topics grab our fancy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, action. Pablo. Alex. How are you? I'm doing all right. How about yourself, sir? Very well, thank you. I'm sitting out here on the deck. I thought I'd just come out and sit in the in the sunlight on the on the deck here in the forest. And of course, one of the dogs has already run away, and I'm supposed to be looking after them. So the dog will come okay. back. Yeah, they they return in the end. They know they know where they are fed and housed. So I have confidence that he'll come back. Oh yes. You know what I saw last night? I saw a film that I have not seen in forty years. And it's called Fade to Black. Have you ever heard of it? Fade to Black? Yeah. No, I don't, well, I don't know. Tell me about it. Well, so uh, uh, I'll just go back a little bit uh, by a year because when I, when I actually saw Breaking Away in 1979, which is a, a wonderful little uh, uh, sort of indie movie about this aspiring bicyclist. Um, and it's the, the main character is played by Dennis Christopher. So I saw that in 1979, and I really wanted to be Dennis Christopher's character from Breaking Away. But in retrospect, uh, I have to say that I kind of turned out more to be a little bit like uh, his character in uh, Fade to Black, who uh, ends up being this guy who rides a Vespa, which I had, and wears sweater vests, which back in high school I did, uh, where he works around 35 millimeter film canisters, which I still do. And he, he watches 16 millimeter films in his house, which I still do. He's surrounded by movie posters, which of course I am. Um, and he's obsessed with movies. Uh, then of course it takes a dark turn because he ends up at first sort of inadvertently killing some people and then a little bit more <laughs> advertently. That, that part does not fit in yet with my timeline, but I, I just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you had a Vespa. I did, yeah, for the longest time. Um, and I only I only sold it uh, probably like six, six, seven years ago to someone who put it in his garage and then it got ripped off because it was a really nice. Um, oh. Yeah, no, it had uh, it had um, it was 200 cc's. It could cook. It was a, you know, really nice Italian Vespa. So. Uh, well, that's what they do. They fade away. I don't know where any of my motorcycles went either. But yep, they fade to black. Um, probably just as well. But listen, uh, speaking of the past and I. I want to title today's episode Alex's Last Hamburger. I mean, I might add a few other things to it, but uh, I do want to get back to that because um, I wanted you to elaborate on your story for that since uh, there was there was a hamburger segue on our last episode, but we're going to we're going to make up for it today. So. Do you, would, would you do us the favor of... Um, okay, this, <clears throat> this is the story of why I'm a vegetarian. I, many years ago, like in the late 1970s or early... Probably in 1979, uh, maybe 1980, but most likely 79, I was in my uh, little one-room apartment in Venice, California one evening, and I decided, hey, I'm going to like listen to music and trip on acid. And so I'd <laughs> taken this tab of acid and was lying there like listening to my, my album, whatever it was, and a knock at the door, and it's a buddy of mine. Um, a guy called Todd Darling, no relation to Todd Davies. And he says, uh, hey, do you want to come to a, and see a show? I've got a spare ticket. And I say, no, no, I was just thinking of sitting here and staring at the wall. This <laughs> and, 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 and he goes, no, it's a ticket to Bob Marley and the Whalers. Yes. And I said, whoa, you're kidding. He, no, I'm coming. Okay, let's go. And so um, I, he, we got in his car. Uh, I imagined he'd been looking for a date cuter than I, but but luckily I had received the the, un, the unused ticket, and so he drove us to the um, the venue, which was we were at UCLA. There was some kind of sports happened. I think they played basketball or baseball or something uh, in the alumni stadium, and that was where this 
this concert was happening, this, this big gig. And so it was like festival seating. We were up on the second level, kind of slightly behind the band. It was such a huge stadium and there were seats all across the, you know, where they normally played. And pff, we saw Bob Marley and the Whalers play and it was fantastic. Um, and I realized that because we were just slightly behind the band, I realized that the the band were all taking their cues from the these three women who were in the front, who were the um, the singers, yeah. the, the, the the gal vocalists, you know, and and there was Bob Marley at the front as well, and it was incredible. And so we saw this Bob Marley gig, and I was tripping on acid, and then. And then, and we left. We were all, everybody's all trooping out. And they hadn't done a, uh, an encore because of whatever the stadium or something or the acoustics, whatever. They didn't do an encore. And then, but then as everybody was trooping out, then there was a rumor that they were going to do an encore. And so everybody started trooping back in again. And in the massive flux of like 10,000 people going back and forth, or however many it was, um, I and my buddy Todd lost sight of each other. And I, I, and I think that he went back in to see if there was going to be a, a, an encore and they didn't do one. And, and I just gave up and walked out. And so then I realized, well, shoot, I've got no idea where the car is, you know, where we <laughs> parked it. And, and I have no idea where my buddy is either. So I guess I'll just go home, you know. But for some reason, it didn't occur to me that I could take the bus. I could catch the Santa Monica bus or the RTD, you know. And so I walked down Wilshire Boulevard all the way down to the to the ocean, turned left uh, where, the, where the highway ends and walked down to Venice, um, which I checked is a 17-mile walk. Wow. And about two miles from my destination, uh, sort of at the end of Pico or the end of Ocean Park, there was a hamburger joint called Tommy's Number 5. And I thought, hey, I haven't eaten anything since lunch, you know, and, and I should get something to eat now. So I go to Tommy's Number 5 and order up a Tommy's Number 5 burger and sit down to eat it. And I take my first mouthful of burger and I'm still tripping. And <laughs> I see inside my stomach, my stomach speaks to me. And my stomach says, listen, um, I'm your stomach and your stomach is full of acid. And the acid is used to dissolve the meat and other difficult to digest substances, which you occasionally digest. You haven't eaten meat in a while. So the weak, the stomach uh, acid is quite weak at the moment. We're going to have to boost it up a bit. it take a while. Um, are you going to continue eating meat or are you just going to give it up because you have to make a decision one way or the other for the sake of the system here? And so I said, oh, well, I just won't eat meat anymore. And so I abandoned the remains of my Tommy's number five burger and and became a, a, a fishitarian. <laughs> you know, um, I'm so glad you told me my story. I'm so glad you told the story again, because I, when you first told it to me, the way that I remembered it was that that you had a conversation with the hamburger as it was going through your body. But what, for some reason, I thought it was basically a link between you and the cow, like, like the cow was somehow talking to you. Um, and, and I'm glad that you've elaborated that it was your body talking to you about. Yeah. Much more likely. Don't you think that I would have a conversation with my own stomach than with the deceased, the poor deceased factory farmed, cow from well you know, on, on acid you never five. know i mean everyone has a different trip <laughs> that's for sure um you know so uh, i told you i'd be able to relate this to a cinematic event and um and that would be the way that uh, i mean i i went vegetarian after watching the original the texas chainsaw massacre for the first time in college uh it was a, a evening campus screening it was a sold out show 250 other stone kids and I just found out, actually, I'm not the only one who went vegetarian after seeing the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, director Guillermo del Toro had the same reaction, um, which I think is fascinating and, and probably not too unusual. In my case, it was revolving around the pivotal scene uh, in the first act when um, our, our, you know, the, the kids in the van pick up the hitchhiker and the hitchhiker describes in great and bloody detail how he came from a long line of um, of cattle butchers who, you know, they and, and basically he describes how their jobs were 
killed off by automation. But he's he talks about how they would, you know, uh, kill the cows. And then he goes on to describe in more gory detail the recipe for how his family would make head cheese. And oh God. <laughs> it was but but in a way, in a way. In my case, maybe I can say that the cows were talking to me because it actually interrupted the um, that sort of uh, flawless uh, flow in which, you know, like it, as a consumer, when you just go and you you get a hamburger and everything's just neatly, you know, presented to you and and it smells good and it tastes good and you eat it. And I, I, I hadn't really been thinking about the chain of food production and how it gets made and and how it used to get made. And and that that movie actually made me think about those details. And it sort of it really kind of changed things. Interesting. So that was <laughs> that's, well, that <laughs> yeah. speaks I mean, well for the I power think, of movies, isn't it? Of I think it's possible that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre has maybe turned more people vegetarian than even Paul McCartney, because I think it's more more visceral <laughs> the reaction. How interesting. As yeah. To, well, that's very. Yeah. Um, yeah. I never thought about that, but that's a very interesting observation. And not only did the Texas Chainsaw Massacre cut down probably on a lot of. Um, uh, you know, people who used to n not think too much about where their meat came from. But according to Edwin Neal, who is the actor who played the hitchhiker, and I, and I actually brought him out to Boulder 20 years ago. Apparently, he says that uh, Texas state troopers would shake his hand after that movie and uh, tell him that he caused crime to drop 18% because so many people stopped hitchhiking. Um, after that that movie, which is uh, and again, I, I kind of like the idea of, of picking up people who need a ride. But yeah. But so what was his point? Was that the hitchhikers themselves were being attacked by the drivers? Uh, no, no, no. Well, the, the, the hitchhiker character in the movie ends up attacking um, the people in the, you know, in the van. Um, and it, it is one of those moments that kind of makes you think twice about picking up a hitchhiker. Yeah, but because... no, but that's my question is why did the state troopers say that crime dropped because there was less hitchhiking? Who was robbing who? Was the were the hitchhikers or the drivers of the cars the criminals? Nah, good question. I don't know. I, I think it, that's that's a that's something. Uh, speaking from just uh, my you know stories that I've heard from friends from uh, from college days and high school days, that is a two way street. You know, I mean, it could be the person who's picking you up because they you know they might have have something in. You know, they might be able to have a gun to put on you, but it could also be the person you pick up. You never know. It's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting detail. Yeah, there's an interesting story on the web um, that you can read uh, by somebody who was picked up by one of the serial killers. Um, or rather, <laughs> who gave a ride to. No, that was what it was. He gave a ride to the serial killer and then realized that when the guy opened his bag, he had his characteristic clown serial killer mask inside and so it's a really creepy story, supposedly true. But anyway, enough of these hideous things. Yeah. Well, um, oh, so he, I've actually got a segue to go on to the next bit that I want to talk about, because you went to a, a Bob Marley show when you were talking about your last hamburger. And, um, and I think it was a great show, too, just as you would expect. It was great. Yeah, I'm sure. In the mid 80s, there was this straight edge punk band by the name of Fugazi that I really liked. Um, and the lead uh, the lead singer wanted to uh, when he created the Fugazi band, he actually wanted to fuse the music of the Stooges with reggae. Now, previous to Fugazi, that guy was in a band called Minor Threat, and they are one of many bands who appear in a new documentary that is uh, about the punk scene in Washington, D.C. between Let's see, was it 1976, 1983? And this documentary is called Punk the Capital, Building a Sound Movement. And it starts screening from our website at internationalfilmseries.com this Friday, May 14th. Now, Alex, you happen to have already- I have seen it and I really recommend it. It's a very good documentary. Well, tell me more about it, because I'm going to I haven't seen it, but I will be watching it uh, as soon as it pops up on the website this Friday. But uh, what, what can you tell me that um, caught your interest about that, Doc? 
I was dubious yeah. uh, going in because I uh, I grew up around the um, the Los Angeles punk scene and so tended to view all these other cities, except for Akron, Ohio, of course, was was the kind of mecca of punk. But apart from that, you know, I tended to think of L.A. as being where the real the real punk thing happened in, in America. But this film makes a powerful case for there being a, an excellent, if, if a bit smaller, punk scene in um, in DC, and it features um, the predecessor band to the ones that you mentioned, uh, Bad Brains. Ah, uh-huh. uh, and it features all those bands, in fact. But Bad Brains, man, wow, yeah, they're great. What a good band. They're great. Yeah, I was taken aback because I just wasn't aware. I wasn't aware of Bad Brains. They even came and played in Los Angeles when I lived there, and I didn't go and see them. Uh-huh. And thinking about it now, man, when seeing some of the footage of of, of several of the bands, but in particular Bad Brains, um, they were incredible. It was it was a really interesting punk scene. Well, and uh, and I guess one of the because it was it's two directors who are behind this documentary, and one of them, um, I, I just looked at the press notes briefly, and it said that uh, he was he was twelve years old when when that scene was erupting around him. Um, but the the thing that really got my attention was um, several people mentioned that the uh, the the amount of um, Super Eight footage, home movie footage, uh, and also as well as like some of the uh, ephemera, you know, the fanzines and the posters of the whole scene, um, it really adds a lot of. Uh, oh yeah, they're lucky. I mean, it wouldn't be the same without the without the the audiovisual aspect. You know, obviously, it, yeah. it, it, there is footage of Bad Brains and these other bands playing. It's great. Also, interestingly, they choose the same trajectory as the L.A. scene had because the L.A. punk scene at the beginning was very, very diverse and had like all kinds of different bands like the Weirdos and the Go-Go's and and the the Go-Go's before they were a pop group and the Screamers and X. It was a very interesting and multifaceted, the plugs, you know. Uh, scene, yeah. which gradually over a, the same time frame as they're talking about, like 70, 77 to 83, turned into a hardcore scene, um, which although it featured fabulous, fabulous uh, mosh pits and slam dancing, but also did, it was it was more monochromatic, monotheistic, you know, it was like white white boys with checkered, checkered shirts and it yeah. wasn't quite as weird as it had been at the outset. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see the two um, cities feature the same trajectory and ultimate end of the, the punk scene. Although I, mean, I know in, in the bands continue and, and, and it, the scene lasted in LA probably through to like 87 or 88. And, and I guess one of the other elements of that time is that because not everybody was plugged in through the, you know, the internet and computers and cell phones, that it, it does speak to the, the facet of how little pockets uh, little cultural pockets, you know, formed in different areas. And so that is fascinating that they had a similar trajectory because it's not as if though there was a, you know, some uh, instant communication between the two. So there's maybe... No, I mean, the yeah. movie Repo Man was really helped by the album because the album was had all of these different LA punk bands. Right. Plus, plus a song by Iggy. And that really did... That picked up and, and and they were selling copies of the album. It was in its second printing, vinyl record, you know. Yeah. Um, and because it was a sampler of the LA scene. Right. Sure. And people were really hungry for that. And they and the record executives are going, Well, why are we selling so many copies of this in Akron? You know, and 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 and, and it really helped the film. Yeah, that's great. And I, you know, now I don't recognize all the bands that get listed in the uh, you know, uh, as as being covered in the documentary, but some of them are bands that did uh, come through Boulder quite a, quite a few times, like the untouchables. And then of course the, the Henry Rollins comes through all the time and, and he gets a, a plug in there as well, I guess. And he was also part, I mean, he, I guess he was everywhere because he, he was in uh, when Keith Morris left 
Black Flag in Los Angeles, he became the lead singer of, of Black Flag, and they touch on that in this documentary as well. Now, and you were the one that was asking me why Jello Biafra would be in there since he was from San Francisco. Again, I haven't seen it yet. Is uh, is there a quick answer to whether, or does he even get much screen He's time? in it, but he's not in it for very much, but obviously he, there, there's a bolder connection. I was, I've forgotten what it was. I watched it about a month ago, and I've, for, yeah. I've forgotten, but there was there was a bolder connection for, for both of those guys. Yeah, well, I mean, so I'm just gonna put it out there again for people. I don't, who are, I'm not a Boulder connection. I mean, I mean a DC connection for both of those. Well, guys. for for Jello Biafra, there is a Boulder connection. Which, so to anyone listening who is thinking about watching this, you know, of course, Jello Biafra went to Boulder High School and then then went to San Francisco uh, and then formed the Dead Kennedys and then, you know, uh, the Alternative Tentacles and uh, the the you know the label and um, et cetera. So, and, and yeah, he's come through plenty of times. So. For for Boulder listeners who have seen the Dead Kennedys or Jello, I mean, this is going to be a documentary that will be of interest to you. He, and also, it's I mean, and it does also parallel the the English punk experience as well. And I imagine all the big U.S. cities was that it, it it went hand in hand with like independent record production. Yeah, you know, they were actually ma- making their own vinyl. Yeah, that's that, and, and that's 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 an, that's a, that's a very key part of the whole punk ethos, right? It's the DIY, do it yourself. So, oh, uh, I want to reach into the mailbag real quick because we did get a little uh, uh, message. We, well, not a little. We, we got an email actually. It was from Ian Schultz, and he wanted to just let us know that he had a couple recommendations for you and I um, for Fassbinder, and he wanted to say that in a year of thirteen moons is, quote, an insanely downbeat drama about a transgender woman who gets a sex change to please her lover and gets rejected. And then he also had some two cents to toss in regarding um, Ralph uh, Bakshi, which we talked about previously. And he said, Ralph Bakshi's coonskin, as the UK VHS proclaims, quote, this year will offend everybody, end quote, is a savage indictment of racism in the U.S., which uses every stereotype imaginable. And it's also available to watch for free on Canopy as well. So, Ian, thanks for... Huh, how <laughs> interesting. You know, I forgot about Coonskin. Yeah. Because it was very controversial. Right. And, and I, I haven't seen it. I forgot about it. Yeah. No, I... Um, we've, we've definitely got some stuff to catch up on, but it's nice to know a that... Canopy it, is a service that you can access through certain public libraries, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, it's uh, if you're a university student, um, you probably already have access, but also, yeah, it's through public libraries. And if, if you haven't looked into it, it is an amazing resource for a lot of great titles. And um, just pick up a library card and you will be set. You can pick out pretty much anything you want to check out. And yeah, no, it's uh, so thanks, Ian, um, for that recommendation. Yeah, thank you for that recommendation. That's I, yeah, I actually want to see that film. Yeah, I, don't, I, mean, I think I saw it a long time ago, and, and but uh, time has gone by. Like <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I, let's let's call it a let's let's call it a day for for this podcast. But um, we'll get we'll come back uh, next week, and uh, I've I've got a couple of things that I've been meaning to toss your direction, Alex. But I'll need to check my notes, which I don't have in front of me. So, um, well, give us your thoughts. About about the um about the DC Punk documentary. Oh yeah, well. for sure. No, I'm going to check that out this weekend. To say about that, I um, I'm uh, I, you know, I, I I'm with you in terms of um, just really being kind of in awe for uh, just you know the the bad brains are just amazing. So yeah, it's nice. I mean, if you get a chance, oh oh, listeners, um, yeah, um, watch it on the on the IFS. Uh, site will speak more internationalfilmseries.com and the distributors are splitting half of the proceeds with us which we appreciate and uh, today we found out um, that it looks very hopeful that we'll be back in our Munzinger auditorium uh, this fall um, they're, oh fantastic yeah, how great yeah they're starting oh to, wow yeah, great they're starting to open things up so we're excited about that possibility uh, let's everyone do your bit out there don't don't screw it up just yet we we still have a ways to go before we're completely in the clear but it's looking pretty good right now and we look forward to you know being back in our venue uh, until then please check out internationalfilmseries.com and Alex thank you so much for checking out some of the movies that we're plugging away at here and um, we'll talk thank again next for, week thank you for giving me the free ticket to watch the DC uh, <laughs> sure all right um, all right man yes Talk again soon.
Okay, that's a wrap. Thanks again for joining Alex Cox and myself today. I'd like to thank Jason Phelps for handling the audio and Ted Thacker for letting us use the intro to his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna, for the musical cues that bookend these conversations. And if you'd like to contact us, please email pablo at internationalfilmseries.com.